So as we start today, I, I want to do things a little different than the way I've done uh, Bible study for the past couple of hymns. And I wanted to start right off in the hymn. And it's a hymn that we all know. In fact, we sang it just a few weeks ago at church. Now, our hymnal calls it When Peace Like a River, but really the title that most of us know it by is It Is Well With My Soul. And the reason our hymnal does it is our hymnal lists them by the first line. And so as we begin today, we're going to just start off by reading together, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, trying to read this is going to be weird because you're used to singing it, and it as well with my soul has a little bass kind of repeat here, but, but let's just try and read it together as it's written on the screen, the chorus. It is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Y'all know that hymn, don't you? You probably can't count how many times you've sung it. But the story behind it is amazing and heartbreaking. It's written by a man named Horatio Spafford. And there's Horatio right there. He's born in 1828 in Troy, New York, which is just outside of Albany. In 1861, he marries Anna Larson. That's her right there in Chicago. And they are respected pillars of their community. At their home on the north side of Chicago, the Spaffords hosted and sometimes financially supported many guests. Horatio was active in the abolitionist crusade. He was a senior partner in a thriving law firm, and he had invested a lot of money in real estate and the expanding Chicago city and Chicago area. He was a devout follower of Jesus an elder in his church, and very good friends with the famous pastor D.L. Moody. When you think about the Spafford family, you would think that this family has a wonderful life together. But tragedy strikes this family. In 1781, their four-year-old son, also named Horatio, he dies from scarlet fever. Later on in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroys much of the city. The Spaffords had invested a lot of money in real estate, and it was destroyed. They were financially devastated. In 1873, another economic downturn hit the family's money more. And so on the advice of his good friend, D.L. Moody, and to benefit his wife's health, Spafford planned an extended stay for his family in Europe. His wife, Anna, and their four daughters and several other friends would sail to Europe for a long vacation. However, Spafford was forced to stay behind for business reasons. Horatio sent his wife and four girls on to Europe and said that he would join them in a couple of weeks. So Anna and their four young daughters, Annie, Maggie, Bessie, and Tanetta, they left on the steamship Ville de Harve for Europe. However, early in the morning on November 22nd, 1873, the ship that they were sailing in collided with a Scottish iron clipper. It sank in 12 minutes. Anna Spafford was picked up 
from the ocean unconscious. However, their four daughters drowned in the Atlantic Ocean. Anna was placed on a ship called the Tri-Mountain and set sail for Wales. Horatio learned about the shipwreck in the Chicago newspapers, and in agony, he waited for information to find out about the status of his wife and four daughters. And nine days later, he receives this telegram from Wales. It's from Anna. It says, Saved alone, what shall I do? Mrs. Goodwin, a friend of theirs, the children, their four daughters, Willie Culliver, who was a neighbor, lost. Go with LaRue, who was a French minister and a fellow survivor of the shipwreck, until answer. Horatio's four daughters, all under 11 years old, were dead. Friends of his, dead. His wife, in Europe, waiting for him. Horatio immediately left for Chicago to go to Europe to bring his wife home. Now remember, this is the 1800s. There's no planes, there's no cell phones. And as his ship is crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the captain calls Horatio to his cabin and tells him, we are now passing over the spot where the ship went down. Horatio wrote to Rachel, his wife's half-sister, on Thursday, we passed by over the spot where she went down in mid-ocean, the waters three miles deep. But I do not think of my dear ones there. They are safe, folded the dear lambs. It's on this trip that Horatio gets out a pen and paper and writes the hymn, It Is Well, with my soul. This hymn is written by a man who is devastated, who is broken, who is completely helpless. This is a hymn that he writes where he is pouring out his heart to God. I have two little kids on my own. I can't begin to imagine the pain and sorrow that Horatio must be feeling. He's lost a son. His finances devastated in the great Chicago fire. I'm sure he probably lost friends in that fire as well. He's trying to send his family on this vacation to recover from this devastation and now his four daughters are dead. He's trying to get to his wife, who is also suffering. How he can even hold a pen, let alone write this hymn, is beyond anything I can comprehend. And so we're going to take a look at this hymn. And now knowing the backstory of this hymn... I don't know about you, but for me, it, it just gives me such new perspective. But before we dive into the hymn, questions? Questions about his life? Questions about anything? Just, just a tragic, tragic story. So let's read verse 1 together. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Most people can't comprehend how he could write those words. 
His world is falling apart. He's mourning the death of his family. And this sorrow that he is facing, it's crashing on him like sea billows, sea waves crashing on that ship that he was on. Waves coming over his head. But yet he says, whatever my lot, or in other words, whatever happens in life, be it good, be it bad, whatever happens in life, my God has taught me to declare it is well with my soul. Horatio's only answer to everything happening in his life right now is Jesus. And it gives him peace. Perhaps that first line, when peace like a river, he got from Isaiah 48, 18. Oh, that you would listen to my commands, that you would have peace flowing like a gentle river and righteousness rolling over you like waves in the sea. Horatio Spafford had hope and faith and his Lord, Jesus Christ. And in this moment, I think the Holy Spirit truly allowed him to understand those words of Paul, words that we've read that we just sometimes don't get in 1 Thessalonians 5, where he says, always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Jesus. I don't know about you, but for me, when I think about tragedy in this world, and there's tragedy in this world, when I think about tragedy in people's own personal life, I have no idea how they do it without Jesus. Life can be cruel and hard and difficult and filled with pain and suffering and when that happens where do people find hope and peace where do they find meaning in the midst of it what 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 tells them that that there is light at the end of the tunnel if they don't have jesus for me that's the only thing that gets me through sometimes I've told you this before, my favorite verse in all of Scripture. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. All the pain and suffering we have in this world, and it can be devastating. When we are finally in God's eternal glory, it's going to feel like nothing. Because we're in the presence of the Almighty God whole and well. Questions, insight about verse 1 in the hymn. So let's look at verse 2. Let's read it together. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and shed his own blood for my soul. Friends, there is a spiritual world out there, and we touched on it a little bit last week when we talked about cherubim and seraphim and angels. However, there is also Satan. And we kind of misunderstand Satan. Do you know in Hebrew, Satan is not a name, but it's a title? If the Hebrew language was actually translated properly to English, we wouldn't say Satan, or we would say the Satan, which means the adversary. And this is what the Bible says about him. First of all, words from Jesus from John 8, 44. 
For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is, the liar, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And these words by the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1.8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, I'm not going to get in to everything about Satan right now. Maybe that's a Bible study that we can do at a later time, talking about these spiritual beings, about Satan and the fallen angels. But Satan, the devil, the adversary, whatever we call him, he is against God and he is against followers of Jesus Christ. He wants nothing better than to trip us up, to cause us to stumble. When life gets messy and hard, and I'm not going to say this, I'm not Flip Wilson who says the devil made me do it. I'm not saying all the pain and hardship in life is the result of Satan. It's sometimes our own fault because we sin, we mess up. Sometimes it's the fault of someone else who sins and messes up and it affects us. But no matter what it is, Satan is whispering there saying, why would God let that happen to you? That God is no good. Give up on that faith. It's worthless. And so when Spafford writes, though Satan should buffet. Now we don't use the word buffet in 2020. But where he got it from was most likely 2 Corinthians 12, 7. The King James Version that he read. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, most of our modern English translations don't say buffet, but they would say Satan tormented me. Spafford understood that as a follower of Jesus Christ, Satan wanted to torment him. That when trials in life happen, Satan was going to be there. But even though that happens, he knows that it is not Satan who he puts his trust in, but it is the Lord God Almighty. It is his Savior, Jesus Christ, who rescued him from his helpless estate. Listen to what Romans 5, 6-8 tells us. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. Now, most of us would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In that helpless estate that Horatio Spafford was in, he remembered that God loved him so much that even though he was a sinner, Jesus Christ came to die for him. And it gave him such great hope, and peace. Questions, insights on verse 2 before we move on to verse 3. All right, let's read it together. He lives, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Now I talked about this a few weeks ago, but now with the understanding 
of Spafford's story, to me this verse is given such deeper meaning. He writes, bliss. Now bliss, it basically means great happiness or joy. And Spafford says, despite everything that has happened in life, he finds great joy in knowing that Jesus has given him life. Life through Jesus' death and resurrection. I'm sure that as he's writing this, he's thinking about his children. Remember what he wrote to his sister-in-law. He says, they're not there anymore. They're with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to him, that's a glorious thought that gives him such great joy. Through Jesus' death on the cross, his sins are forgiven. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ and he forgave you all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against you and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory, for, victory over them on the cross. My sin is nailed to the cross. And I don't bear the weight of it anymore. And for that... I praise the Lord and say it is well with my soul. Questions on verse 3. Okay, verse 4, and once again, let's read it together. And Lord, haste the day when our faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trumpet shall sound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Let's admit something here. We don't talk like that anymore, do we? And I'm not saying the way we talk is good or bad. It's just different. But we don't say things like, And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. Let me try to modern that up for you. Lord, on that day, on that day when I see you face to face, on that day when you return, I will celebrate. And Lord, it can't come quickly enough. Don't be hasty. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. This is what Paul tells the church in Corinth about Christ's return. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed into immortal bodies. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
when Horatio Spafford was writing verse 4 to It is well with my soul. He was looking forward in hope of the return of Jesus. The resurrection of the dead. Well, I can't say this for sure. The hope that his four daughters and his son would be resurrected. Resurrection. I think we as the church do a disfavor and don't talk about it as enough. We talk about Jesus' resurrection all the time. And don't get me wrong, greatest event in all of human history. But we're going to rise too. And every week in our creeds, we proclaim it. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Or when we recite the, the Nicene Creed, we say, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God made a promise to all of us that we will rise again from the dead. And here's the good news. When we do, back to what 1 Corinthians said, those immortal bodies that we have, or I'm sorry, those mortal bodies that we have that get sick, that break down, that hurt, that need things like hearing aids and glasses and walkers and canes and medicine, they will be transformed into immortal bodies that never die. Spafford's children were dead. And he mourned. But he also had hope that on the day Jesus returned, they would rise from the grave. That when Jesus returns, earth will be transformed. Sin and death and the grave gone forever. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more tears. All those things washed away. Questions, comments about verse 4. I don't know about you, but the next time we sing It Is Well With My Soul, it's going to be completely different for me. And maybe there might be a little tear in my eye when I think about the suffering that he went through, but also the joy and knowing that this man's hope was in Jesus Christ. And through this hymn, many others can find hope as well. If there's no other questions or comments, I can close this in a word of prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, in life we are going to have difficulties, pain and suffering and heartache. But the truth is that for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, for those of us who have hope in Him, we can truly say it is well with our souls because of Jesus. To alone, Lord, be all glory, be all honor, be all worship. Bless this group as they go forth from this place. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Once again, thank you for joining us for Bible study. Once again, I'm not sure which song I'm going to look at next week, but I will let you know, and thank you for joining us.
For those of you who couldn't make it, who are watching this online right now, thank you for being here as well. And may God's blessings be with you.